perfecto y de ahí veamos ok estamos solo los tres <risa> Eh, estábamos con este tema ya tenemos más atendiz Ted, ahí está Ted Hi there Hi Ted, welcome Thank you, thank you <laughs> How are you? Ha, okay. Um, I'm glad got the time okay. I was a little worried. <laughs> yes, this is Christian and Anna who were organizing everything with me as well. So I wanted to introduce you all together. <laughs> well, great. Uh, great Hi. to be here. Really good Hi. to be here. Welcome. How's this, how has this series been so far? It's been very interesting. Uh, we've had like a wide range of um, panelists, so it's been really nice um, to see like the perspective of you know architects, known architects, and today will be no no different from that. <laughs> right. Sure. Sure. Well, I hope I can contribute something. We'll see. No, um, for sure. Olympia how are things in How are things in Quito? Uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. It seems more normal than it should be sometimes. <laughs> we were very closed up for a while. Yeah, same here. It's, it, you know, we're still masked, but um, we're for the most part in person. I don't know if that's good or bad, but... <laughs> Us too, we have a high rate of vaccination uh, in the whole country, but we are still wearing masks uh, more, more than in the US, I think. Uh, yeah, the US is a mess, but you know, not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I do what I can. <laughs> yeah, and for us, we, we have partial, uh, partial attendance Uh, to school some some teachers are teaching um, in person some be, some teachers are teaching online and students do both yeah for for three semesters i taught exclusively via zoom online and it was all uh, students in china and so i would be getting up here like 5 30 in the morning um there was a 12 or a 13 hour difference hi olympia um, hi olympia hello hello hi well, Thank you very much. <laughs> no, I'm glad. So this is this is us all. <laughs> okay, good. Hello, Great. Yeah, Christian and Ted. Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Olympia. Welcome. Yeah, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much. I just I just uh, this this poster on my back like just fell and the the glass broke so i i am oh, a little no. late because i was trying to make <laughs> oh, sure no. i don't step on glass at least and then right. i'll take care of it later <laughs> i did that in my office upstairs um oh you know maybe a couple of weeks ago and i just left it there for 10 days <laughs> you know i just didn't have the time to clean the damn thing up uh, you yeah, know so yeah. that's probably what's going to gonna happen here <laughs> mm -hmm. so well, maria what's our already... what's our order here so the order of the day will be um ana maria will uh, give a short presentation and then olympia will be um the first uh, to speak i will present Olympia and uh, Ana Maria will be presenting uh, Ted uh, afterwards and then Christian will be uh, having the Q&A. So uh, we will be asking uh, for questions uh, through the Q&A uh, panel. Uh, you can check on those questions as well and uh, Christian is always good at posing his own questions too so <laughs> that is also nice. Um, we will try to uh, respect the 30 minute um, time frame because I think Olympia has like a tight schedule right? No, 
I mean, for the for the question is okay. Like, I don't I don't have many problems, uh, so don't worry. Okay, perfect. I wasn't sure if you wanted to check anything, like in terms of uh, like screen sharing, or if you have videos or anything you want to check the sound before we begin. I see that for me, the host has disabled the, sh the screen share. Oh. I don't need to share it, obviously. I'm not presenting first. And now I think you both can share. It works okay. for me. All right, great. Okay. I will have a couple of videos, uh, very, very short. Some are just maybe basically they're GIFs rather than videos. Um, and I'm gonna be presenting from my keynote presentation because if I present it from a PDF, the, the videos are not working on my computer. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll do that from, from there. Perfect. Do we have anything else, Christian or Anna, that I might be forgetting? Um, no, I don't think so. I think we can wait couple of minutes um, because our students are on the one hand tend to be late and on the other hand this is our um, academic recess week mm. so they might be perhaps. Can I ask you uh, how many students will be attending and what classes and what courses are they following? Uh, we have had uh, around 100 students and they are from all years, from the very first year all the way up to their last semester. So it's a very interesting range of, of, of approaches, experiences, and sometimes very interesting questions as well. And we'll be able to see them or depends on each one? No, uh, no uh, you will not be able to see them. What we will do is uh, we will collect the questions in the Q&A section. And then afterwards, I will be sort of reading them, moderating, sometimes merging questions just because of the time. Okay. Yeah. So it's, um, so we've set it up as a seminar. So they are seeing you and seeing us, but they're, they're not able to like, do anything else. <laughs> I mean, if, um, some, if somebody wants to do, I don't know, to, to have a, a personal approach or something, they can ask us and we can actually make, uh, like make them panelists. But uh, since there is like a lot of people and a lot of fluctuation around the, the conference, they, they come and go, so it's easier this way. Shall we wait one more minute? Yeah. And then we, we can start. Also, Olympia, are you in Milan or where are you now? I am in Milan, yes, yes. Okay. I was I was in another city like until half an hour ago, but uh, oh. I'm in Milano. <laughs> <laughs> it's the fast train that took you back. Yes, exactly <laughs> that one, and uh, one of those uh, rental electrical bikes. So I got out of the station and took one of those. <laughs> and yes, I was in Reggio Emilia, which is my uh, ah. happens to be my hometown, and uh, I have Demand a big. See, <laughs> and uh, and they have uh, I have an exhibition over there, so sometimes I have to go and you know do like tour guides and all those things. <laughs> I saw it. I saw that you saw some kindergarten kids. I wanted to say like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. I I wanted to go and see your work, but it was impossible. So you were it's... just in Italy, no? <laughs> I was there. At three weeks ago, but it was a little bit tough to get to that precise point. But yes, yes. <laughs> soon, another time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perhaps we can start. Um, yeah. 
And then what do you think? Yeah. Uh, Marcelo has just joined. Maybe we can uh, just say hi to Marcelo, who's our dean. And uh, hey there, how you doing? Hi, hi Ted. How you doing? Good. All good. Hello. Hello. Hi, Marcelo. Thank you for joining. Hi. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> you guys ready? Absolutely. Great. Yes, Fantastic. Okay. It's good to see you. it's good to see you. everything start. Okay. Have you been have you been able to see uh any of the other ones? I have not. No. Olivia. <laughs> Well, it's gone quite it's gone quite well, so I'm sure this will be be just another addition to it. We'll keep we keep uh, working forward. You have those recorded, Marcelo or or Maria? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah. I'd love to see them. If I can have them, and they're gonna they're gonna uh, uh, try to make some sort of a compilation and and uh, organize something around it. Great. Okay, I think we can start, right? Yes. Okay, um, welcome everybody to the fifth session of the lecture series, Drawing the Future, Visions of Architectures to Come. Today we have uh, two really interesting guests, Olympia Tagnoli from Olympia Tagnoli Studio at Milan and Ted Brown from Syracuse Architecture. Uh, we are going to start with Olympia's presentation followed by Ted. Uh, please feel free to send all your questions to the questions and answers sections uh, we will address them both after the lectures are over. So welcome, Ted and Olympia. It's an honor, honor to have you here. Uh, now, uh, Marisabe will uh, present Olympia. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Um, I will be presenting Olympia. Olympia Sagnoli was born on a leap year in a small city in northern Italy. At an early age, she moved to Milan, where she's currently living and working. Her visual vocabulary is characterized by soft shapes and chameleonic colors. Over the years, she has collaborated with Tashin, Google, Prada, The New York Times, Apartamento Magazine. Along with commission works, Sagnoli conducts her personal artistic research with with which results have been exhibited in several galleries around the world. In 2019, The New Yorker has published her first cover. Please welcome today, Olympia Sagnoli. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining in and um, I'm going to start by uh, talking about my work a little bit, but um, in the presentation, I also wanted to um, include not only my work, but also some of the works that have been uh, crucial for me or very interesting for me growing up. And I am now calling from Milan, Italy. And um, so definitely some part of my culture and my country are also part of my work. So um, I'm very excited by the idea that we are so far away, but we share this space together. So um, I think we could we both could benefit from knowing a little bit of each other's uh, history and and visual history in this case. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen with you. Can you see it? Okay. Yeah, it works fine. Okay, so um, this is my first digital drawing. I did it on a, one of the first uh, Macintosh computer, Apple computers, that my dad had brought home from, from work. And it had a, one, a, one um, program, one app, on it was called Paint, and um, and I used to use it in my spare time when I was uh, allowed to 
um, stay close to the computer. And uh, I started like playing with um, this sort of like stickers and gifts and also like draw on it. And I, and I always found it very, uh, very interesting and very enjoyable. And uh, uh, it is so funny because I found it quite recently and, and basically it's what I still do to this day every day. I am an illustrator. I was born in, in Italy, in a city, in a small city in the north of Italy called Reggio Emilia. Uh, uh, but I live in Milan, uh, which is a little bit up north. And um, I had the opportunity of traveling a little bit in, in my life and in, in my um, latest years. Uh, but I think that in a way or the other um, or another, uh, my, my country, the country that I come from, is still um, a big part of what I do. And when I was younger, I used to kind of like um, separate myself from, from the culture that I'm from. I, for some reason, I thought that everything that was coming from United States or Asia was much cooler than what we had here in Europe or in Italy. Um, but I think I think it's part of the process of growing up and, and finding new things and finding um, that some things from abroad always seems uh, much cooler and more interesting. Um, and I think it's pretty normal at some point to actually look around what you have around you and uh, sort of like dive deep into your own culture and find some elements that perhaps make you who you are and, and make you unique for, um, for that. So I put together a few, um, a few artists, a few designers um, that um, really influenced me and um, are a part of what I do today. I wrote down their names so that you can um, hopefully see them and maybe write them down and look more um, of their work. So um, part of my inspiration come from illustrations, uh, editorial illustrations um, and uh, advertising advertising illustrations from um, the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s in uh, Italy. Not only, but we're talking about Italy here. So the interesting part is that um, most of these illustrator, illustrators, Fortunato De Pero, Sergio Tofano, and Federico Seneca, are um, not just illustrators. They're not just editorial illustrators, uh, but they started with you know, comic books, for example, with Sergio Tofano, um, with um, uh, packaging design like Federico Seneca, or with advertising design like De Pero, but they all um, touched several other fields. Um, De Pero, for example, is very famous for joining Futurismo, which is a kind of like an avant-garde um, movement, art movement. And uh, he was one of the founders and he um, moved to New York at some point and he um, became an illustrator for uh, Vanity Fair and many other magazines and is now uh, renowned mostly for his uh, painting works. So um, I really like uh, this aspect of their, their personality and their career. And, and also, of course, I love their work. Specifically, I put these three examples together because I like this idea of a body, like, um, like um, uh, visualizing and drawing the human body in a way that's not literal, uh, that's not realistic, but it's much more free and, um, and for me, adventurous. So, uh, these, for example, are some of my works. Um, they're not directly inspired by this um, heritage, let's say, let's say uh, but definitely there's part of that, um, of that style, of that flavor in, in these works. Another uh, hero of mine is called Bruno Munari. And again, what I really enjoy about his work, and I really recommend you, especially if you're studying architecture, design, um, illustration, but also um, you know, other things, even photography, I really recommend to pick up his books. Uh, luckily, some of his books are now um, translated uh, in English, at least. I don't know if they're translated in Spanish, but I'm, I'm sure you can find something. Um, 
Um, and, and even some of his works in Italian are very, very simple to read. So um, uh, if, you, if you can manage, uh, I really, really uh, suggest his work because I think that is hard to describe him. Uh, he grew up studying um, architecture he is an architect, like most designers uh, in Italy. And um, that's the background for at least uh, a generation of, of designers. And um, uh, what I really like about him is the ability of jumping from one dimension to the other, from one field to the other. The illustration on the right is a book that he dedicated to stones that he found by the sea. And on each, these stones are very popular in a specific region of Italy. And they're all with stripes, like white White stripes on it and they're dark uh, stones so he used the natural stripes of the stone to tell a story a little story by adding some little elements visual elements and the book is all about um, this experiments um, the illustration in the in the middle is a sort of like a never-ending research about uh, portraits and faces um, and it's really like a beautiful, um, again, exercise on, on the uh, diversity and, and um, exploration of, of the possibility of a very simple, um, a very simple uh, sign in a way. On the, on the left, there's a lamp that he designed. And so again, that's based on his exploration, on his um, experiments. And it's basically a sock, like a tight, and um, um, and it's like placed on these on these metal circles, creating a, a, a lamp. Um, again, he was a writer. He was a children books um, illustrator. He was an architect. He was um, a graphic designer. There are many wonderful book covers that he illustrated. And um, this ability to break the boundaries of his own practice and explore other territories are definitely something that I really enjoy about his work. And the curiosity that he had towards observing what's around you, nature specifically, if we talk about the the stone um, rocks project, uh, but generally speaking, being very able to uh, be curious and and look at the world in a very um, interesting point, interesting way. And uh, based on similar explorations, I was asked by the New York Times during um, lockdown in Italy last year uh, to illustrate what was my um, what was my day like? <laughs> what was like being isolated in the apartment? And uh, and again, I had much more time to observe reality and to observe nature and um, and whatever was around me during uh, during the lockdown. And so I did this series, which is a sequence of basically I would um, I would be in my bedroom most of the time because I, I, I live in a very small apartment and I would um, observe the light coming from the window. And um, since it was about springtime, it was starting to warm up the weather a little bit. So whatever shape that the, the sun was projecting on the, on the floor, I was following. So I would read, I would literally like put myself in this square or rectangle create, created by, by, the, um, by the, sea, the sun. And I would read, but after like 10 minutes, of course, the shape was moving around the room. So I would move with my book following the, the shape. And at some point, of course, this, the, the shape started moving up on the wall. And it, for me, it was impossible to follow it, but with illustration, you can uh, invent a possible word. So I, I decided to uh, do a similar, a similar uh, observation on, on reality, but this time with illustration, making it possible. So uh, basically it's a little drawing, a funny drawing of me following the light around, around the room. Um, another um, another very interesting aspect of um, of um, you know Italian design, Italian graphic design is graphic design for specifically for companies. So we have a good heritage of, um, especially in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, of great relationships be between um, companies, big companies, and uh, artists. 
for some reason, in that period of time, not just in Italy, but pretty much everywhere in the, in the world, uh, there was a lot of trust between companies and, and entrepreneurs and artists. So this, this trust uh, created um, amazing works that were used for, for commerce, uh, for promoting these companies, but at the same time are still to this day great example of arts, um, of the arts. So I just put like, three examples, they're very, they're very few, but maybe you can look them up. One is Alberto Carboni, Giovanni Pintori, and Franco Grignani. Uh, I want to point out that most of the people that I'm quoting at this point are men. And, um, and it's not because I, I purposely uh, picked men, but because women were basically excluded by this kind of jobs. So uh, up until not too long ago. So um, I think it's a good reflection. It's a good, like, um, kind of like um, a, a, a good way, a good point of view on, on the opportunities that we have now as women. And I think it's really important to realize um, also that. I think it's a point of, um, it's a point of view that's, that, that needs to be underlined in a way. Um, but back to the back to the to the work, they they were able to uh, again uh, use art and graphic design and illustration um, for a purpose. Uh, but they never treated these kind of jobs uh, poorly just because they were commercial. So uh, this is another aspect that I find very interesting, and I've always loved this combination of like mixing the high and lows, as they say, like. Uh, the high of art and the low of commerce or the low of, of um, uh, you know, um, uh, products. So um, I've always, I was always interested in this combination and, um, and I've had the chance to work in this sense uh, with a few projects. Um, this is Barilla, which is a very famous pasta company in Italy and um, somewhere in the world as well. And uh, I've done several works with them um, and very graphic, very like celebrating of a very important aspect of Italian culture, which is food and uh, cuisine and um, sharing um, a very simple a plate of pasta together. It's something that for us is still very important. So um, I think it was really funny to, for me at least, to um, combine this aspect of, of my culture that's so part of it and, and give it like a new fresh look in a way uh, through, through the illustrations. Another aspect that's um, particularly present in Milan is, uh, which is my city, is design. Uh, and when I say design, I mean product design and interior design. Um, we have a big fair happening every year uh, called Salone del Mobile, uh, which is a presentation of the collections of designers and brands. And uh, it's such a beautiful event, international. A lot of people come from abroad uh, and the city really like blows up during those days. It's really nice. And um, the heritage of these designers, uh, these are just three of them, but uh, it's really, really into the texture, into the, um, the, the, the soil of, of the city. And even if you are not interested in design in Milan, you're gonna find design. Like even if you're in your grandma's house, there's gonna be one, at least one object, a lamp, or a chair that she doesn't even know it's designed by one of these uh, great um, designers, but they happen to be. And um, it seems like I'm ex exaggerating, but it's very, it's very true. Uh, so these are Ettore Sozzas, Enzo Mari, and Alessandro Mendini. Uh, I won't go into detail in each of them because it's it's going to be too long otherwise. But what I really like about uh, they're very different from each other, but for several reasons, uh, political, social, and uh, also like uh, the approach that they have towards design. Sotsas is very, um, you know, uh, ironic and very like, it doesn't take design so seriously. And Somari is much more rigorous. He has an idea uh, where design has to be a social, has to have a social um, aspect to it. It has to, uh, 
produce objects that are not just useless, but they need to be uh, used for something, for a purpose. And um, so these are different approaches to design, but the I think that the bottom line and something that really connects them all is the irony in a way that they have towards uh, their practice and um, the relationship with um, materials and colors and um, how they can make a very simple object like a mocha mocha uh, and turn it into a beautiful piece of art and this attraction towards uh, designers and design and objects uh, led me to um, concentrate more on objects and, and therefore working not just on the bi-dimensional uh, let's say 2d uh, aspect of my works which most of them are born into a sketchbook, so they're flat um, and they're just like a pencil on top of a piece of paper. Uh, but then um, some of them can detach themselves from, from the paper and become something else. So uh, these are a few experiments that I've done in that sense, trying to make a bi-dimensional drawing, like a two-dimensional drawing into a, something else. So I, I launched this little um, shop with my dad. It's called Clodomiro. And, um, and it features um, some objects that are inspired by objects that we like, meaning design, product design in general. And, um, but they feature all elements of like the body. They're a little erotic sometimes. They, they deal with love. And so, for example, on the, on the left, it's these two pillows that are printed on both sides. And so it's like two women and two men. So every day, basically you can create this sort of like connection, this kiss in two different way, uh, ways in actually eight different ways because there are four combinations. And on the, on the right, it's a vase, like a ceramic vase uh, that resembles a naked person. Um, and again, they were born out of a sketch, of course, on the sketchbook, but they became something, something else. The same happened with um, these um, sculptures that I've done for a, an exhibition in, um, in Milano. And uh, I've been asked to work together with these um, engineers uh, to create some sort of like uh, animated illustrations, but analogical in analogical ones, analogic, I don't know. And uh, so basically we did this uh, plexiglass sculptures and in the back of them, we created, they created, the engineers created a sort of like little mechanism that could, could make them move. And again, this is this comes from a flat design, but it has um, something added to it that that makes it uh, interact with the with the space. This is the um, this is the this is a bit very big, more than two meters high um, um, installation at the entrance of my uh, new exhibition. And again, I wanted an illustration to be alive in a way, in a very analogic way, without making like strange things or using screens or new technologies. And, um, and that's a direction where um, that, that I would like to keep exploring in, in a way or another. Um, another aspect that, again, it's very important in Milan and uh, everyone talks about it. And it's, it's really like one of the topics that um, make the world go around here, it's fashion. And um, I put together a few experiment, a few ex uh, examples of um, of brands and designers that I that I really enjoy. And there are several reasons. There are many more, but um, these three: Miu Miu, Moschino, and uh, Fiorucci, are all designers that, in a way inspired me in my work. Miu Miu is a branch of Prada, but it's specifically designed for, um, for younger girls. And it's um, really inspired by the 1960s and the 1970s. And it's a little bit retro, but with a, with a modern touch to it. Uh, Moschino is um, it's a brand that was super popular in the 80s. And um, it was really, um, in, for me, it was really important to grow up around people wearing Moschino because first of all, they were amazing garments and amazing, beautiful dresses. But aside from that, the character 
characteristic of Moschino is the irony behind every piece. So you would have like, um, you know, skirts covered in grass with real flowers coming out or like, um, like a bag in the shape of a baguette. Um, and now there, now you can find a lot of those things, especially on Instagram or TikTok or, you know, uh, new brands really, really um, do a lot of that. But, uh, but back in those days, it was, it wasn't very popular. So uh, Moschino for me, it's definitely a great example of how to use irony and taste and color um, on, on a shape that's not that easy to, to do that on, because of course they, these pieces need to be, um, need to be able to be sold and, and wore and stuff. So um, that's, that's definitely a, a great example. And I, and I uh, highly recommend you to look for Franco Moschino uh, on Google, perhaps just Google images and you'll find amazing things. Uh, Fiorucci, uh, now it's been revamped, uh, meaning that it's owned by a, um, a, by a private company, but in the 80s, again, it was um, a beautiful, a beautiful brand, uh, again, very experimental, but the, the very in interesting thing is that it was one of the first um, designers that created a concept store. So basically what you had were these uh, stores in Milan, New York, Los Angeles, um, where uh, the store wasn't just a place where you could buy, where you would buy clothes, but it was a place where things were happening and bands were playing and, and you would have Keith Haring in New York, um, you know, signing t-shirts or drawing on the windows and people was um, dancing in the, in the store windows. So the idea of a store of a brand, but also the idea of a, creating a, a, a um, creating the possibilities of, of creating also a cultural movement in a way, I think are very interesting in uh, what Elio Fiorucci uh, did in the 80s and early 90s. Um, this uh, approach and interest interest towards fashion is uh, definitely, you can see it in my works in, in many different ways. Um, sometimes it's more literal, sometimes it's just like uh, vaguely sketched. These are two illustrations that I've done for one mag one uh, newspaper here in Milan, in Italy, La Repubblica on the left, and an illustration that I did for Dior uh, quite recently on the right. And I've had also the opportunity of working in fashion, meaning designing um, designing things and patterns and. Um, and drawings for actual garments, actual actual piece of, of clothes, of clothing. And um, this is, for example, a shirt and a skirt that I designed for an Italian brand called Marella. And this is a, a few illustrations that I did for Prada uh, a few years ago. These on the left were used mostly for t-shirts and, and sweatshirts, but then on the right, you also see an application of the same design on a pair of, uh, of shoes. Um, of course, Italy is not my own, my only place of um, <laughs> information. Like I don't take in my information and my influences and my references just from Italy, but um, but I I always love to look around and find new things and you know be inspired also by other places. And um, definitely one element of my work that really for me is important is color. And uh, these are just some examples of designers and graphic designers and, and painters that really uh, took, took color very, very seriously. These are Joseph Albers, Sister Corita Kent and Max Bill. Um, and, um, and again, these are just like the source of inspiration, uh, some of the sources of inspiration for me regarding the use of colors and uh, regarding like being bold with, with it and making choices that are sometimes um, could, could, could look a little bit scary, but then they're worth a try. And these are just a couple of examples of how I use color. Sometimes uh, colors, color is used to tell a story. Um, for example, when there are only two elements, color is really important to give this sort of like dynamic between the two elements. Um, this is um, uh, an interpretation of um, The Wizard of Oz, Il Mago di Oz, um, and uh, I did um, an entire book uh, I, um, illustrated, I mean, the, the original text 
from 1900 by Frank Baum. I illustrated it with just three colors and one you cannot really see it but it's gold the the one that you see in the in the center of the flowers is gold uh green and black and in this case again choosing color was a really for me was a great direction to have some sort of consistency throughout the the book which which is really long um this is a cover that i did for the new yorker and it was to celebrate the pride month on june uh, 2019 and again, here color is used in a more political way. So it replicates the, um, the LGBT um, Q plus uh, flag. And, um, and again, the, it's, it's used in a very um, you know, uh, meaningful way. Other examples of the use of color and the use of design and them mixed together are these two great um, designers, Luis Barragan and uh, Charlotte Perriand, uh, which work I really, really enjoy and really like, and I always go back to. And again, this idea of a relationship with design, uh, you can always see it in my work. I've done this, um, this pattern for a, a brand uh, here in Milan that makes furniture. And also this is on this on the right is the walls of the first Uniqlo store. Uh, Uniqlo is a Japanese chain. Um, and the first a store that opened in Italy um, had all these like three floors uh, decorated with with these windows inspired by the architecture in Milan. So Milan is a very eclectic city. It has a lot of like different architectural style, um, styles from medieval um, uh, houses to um, modern buildings to um, what we call ra rationalism, rationalismo, which are the buildings from the fascist area. Uh, era and um and also um you know different styles the the 60s the 70s and stuff so i tried to recreate um the var variety of all these styles in um in these windows of milan other artists that for me are really really important and essential uh in my growth as an artist are jean arp barbara hepforth and Keith Haring. And um, I see a little bit of their influence in these um, sculptures that I've done recently uh, for the opening of this exhibition that I have in my own town. Um, and it's on at this moment. So we did this six iron sculptures that were um, colored and now they um, live in different spaces around the city and it was a really fun project because um, they're very tall and people especially kids like to uh, go around them and uh, they seem to have a lot of fun so the last project i'm going to talk to you about it's really again about um, how uh, the inspiration can come really from anything around you and you don't have to look for you know special things or you know particular things necessarily you don't have to travel necessarily uh, i mean it's good to travel if you can but um everything is really around you and you have to really uh, focus on your curiosity and try to improve it and work on it i think because everything could be inspiring. So I'm gonna leave you with this um, little video and then I'm gonna explain you what I did from it. So this was um, an advertising um, uh, jingle and, and uh, video that uh, was running uh, around the mid 80s, beginning of the 90s. And it was an ice cream commercial. And, um, and I, I, used, I used to see 
these one and so many others, especially in that time where everything seems like, you know, politically, socially in Italy, everything seems like um, so, so fascinating, so glamorous. Everyone was um, was like happy, had a lot of money. Uh, the creative industry was blooming. Uh, so there were a lot of like money to be spent in advertising. And so uh, all these advertise, all these commercials were, were like bombarded constantly in our um, children brains and so that's even even if I have uh, uh, you know shown you very sophisticated and, and very um, curated artists and designers and architects so far uh, a lot of my background is also like these commercials and these things that I would see on tv or uh, around Italy when I was growing up so I've always had that in the back of my of my mind, of course. And um, uh, one day I was on a few years ago, I was asked to do a, um, an exhibition in Los Angeles, uh, uh, California. And I was keeping I was I, I mean, I was constantly trying to find something that I could exhibit in the in the exhibition in the show um so what i knew is that i had a white box like the the gallery itself was like a white box and i had to fill the walls of the white box and i had to do it with new works not works that were previously done for other clients but just like a like a dedicated uh, body of work for this specific illustration uh, the exhibition and so i was like sketching but i wasn't sure i was collecting some ideas but I couldn't find exactly what I wanted and one day I was uh riding uh my car in at the seaside not too far from from where I am now and I saw this um ice cream sign I don't know if you can see it uh, on the top right of the image and uh and it was like an old street sign uh probably probably from the late 70s early 80s and um and I looked at it and I, I, I thought it was beautiful, but I didn't have my phone around. I was driving, so I couldn't really um, take notice of it. So I went back home and I tried to find it on Google Maps. So I went back to the town. I went back to the ice cream place that in meanwhile had become like a fruit and vegetable store, not even a gelateria anymore. And um, and so I, I took this snapshot of the of Google Maps and I kind of like kept it there in a mental drawer. And um, and then I started thinking about all these like commercials from, from when I grew up and stuff. And I started sketching and putting together ideas. And I really liked the idea that that sign was kind of like a, a very graphic translation of what a, an ice cream cup would be. And, um, and so I was in the studio here and I, I started sketching and putting together all my, my memories, trying to remember what I, what I liked about that time and why it was influential for me. And I came up with this series for the exhibition of still lifes. So uh, a little bit different from what I do usually because there's a lot of human figures in what I do. And when I do exhibitions, sometimes I like to keep the human figure out. <laughs> uh, it helps me concentrate in a way on other things. And so I did a series of still lives of things and products that were popular in Italy at that time when I was growing up. Uh, and I sort of like envisioned what, what sitting at a bar in Italy during the late 80s, beginning of the 90s with my mom, maybe next to me would be. So I tried to close my eyes and think about trying to have memories of what I could envision in front of me from, from that time. And so this is a series of, of um, uh, you know, tables basically and, and still lives of what I would have in front of me. And so the more I started thinking about it, the more thing, uh, memories came back. And so the idea of brands from that time, the idea of this like very fancy uh, gelato cups would, would you know, show up um, in front of me. And, um, and so basically that's, that's the idea for the exhibition uh, manifest themselves itself. And um, we had this very crazy like Pepsi or Coca-Cola called 101 for maybe two years and then it disappeared. So that's again, like a sort of like nod to, um, to that time. And uh, this is the this is the space, a little video of a model that I did of the exhibition space of the gallery. 
Um, so outside there's a mural um, and inside it's like a white box. So I would have these 10 um, uh, prints facing each other. And then I thought of putting here a, a curtain like old gelateria had one time and even butcher shops here in Italy still have this kind of like, um, this kind of um, curtains. Um, so that was the space. And then we did these two frames with, um, with the square gelatos that were, uh, that were inspired by the, by the sign that I, that I showed you before. And I asked uh, the gallerist if he could find me a television from the 80s where I could run all these commercials. So I kind of like edited them all together. And it's like an hour of Italian commercials from that time, from that age, uh, running constantly in the, in the gallery. And the gallery had also like a, a back room that was really dark. And so I decided to recreate the, the street sign that I found in, um, in Liguria, the region where I was. Um, um, naturally like giving it like a more modern um, set of colors and, and shape, but that's, that's, kind of re that's kind of like ready-made basically. It's just like uh, a piece that it's inspired or, or taken from, from the street, from the existing, and it's just like brought into the gallery as a, a piece. And, uh, and this is a, a neon sign that I, that I designed for the exhibition. And outside, as you can see, there's a there's a mural that the mural that I that I mentioned earlier. So um, I hope you enjoyed. And uh, this is a, again, it's a, just one example of how you can turn pretty much anything around you in in a piece of of art. I think if you really um, work on on your curiosity and putting together all the uh, influences and uh, and the things that you grew up around like and there is no shame about uh, I think being born maybe in a place that, that doesn't look particularly interesting or inspiring because everything can can become in interesting I think so thank you thank you Olympia that was lovely uh, and I like that message especially for the young people that are sort of following the footsteps that you have been creating is to look around and it's there. <laughs> Doesn't have to go, you have to go very far. <laughs> so um, yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I hope you we get those barilla boxes down to Ecuador. Make sure they ship them our way. <laughs> <laughs> I give the I give the floor to Ana Maria, who will be introducing Ted. Thank you, Olympia. Yeah, um, thank you, Olympia. Uh, that was a really inspiring, and and congratulations on your work. I think it's just a little part of your work, and it's amazing. So thank you for being here and for sharing it with us. Uh, so now uh, we're gonna start with uh, Ted Brown. Uh, just give me one second. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Ted Brown is a professor in the School of Architecture at Syracuse University, where he has served as the, the graduate and undergraduate chair and as a director of the Florence program. Uh, Brown's collabor collabor collaborative design practices work within the public and private sectors, addressing architecture and the city at the infrastructural neighborhood and apparatus scale. He's a founding partner of Mangley Brown Studio uh, with, with projects that include mixed use housing, the master plan of the South District neighborhood and the child care campus and Catholic chapel for Syracuse University. In collaboration with the landscape practice CLEAR, Brown has worked on local waterfront redevelopment projects for the city of Syracuse. His founded research includes design of optical concrete and a high performance house and the visualization of archaeological evidence under the Basilica of San Marco in Venice. His work in the visual arts has ranged from landscape miniatures to mixed media stained paintings. Brown's recent research examines ways to link the art of assembly as a material practice with the assembly theory. The forum of, the, of, the, of this work is the Studio RA, Ted Brown and Neil Brown, resulting in articles and design provocations on up on of reassemble. 
fitting reassemblage, reimagine it a uh, landscape as an assemblage practice in the context of assemblage thinking in the visual arts, social theory, and urban geography. Brown received a master of architectural degree from Princeton University and a bachelor of science in architecture from the University of Virginia. Prior to joining the School of Syracuse University or Syracuse Architecture, he taught at University uh, of Princeton at Princeton University and the Oregon School of Design. In, 1970, in 1987, he received the Rome Prize in Architecture and conducting research on early representation of the city. He returned to the American Academy in Rome in 1996 as a visiting architect. He's a fellow of the Gray Center of Art and Inquiry at the University of Chicago, where he had a, he, he was resident in 2018. Welcome, Ted. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much, Anna. And thank you, Olivia. Great, great start to the day. Um, uh, and this will be a little different. Um, and I will move as I do uh, fairly rapidly. I'm going to share screen. See that okay? Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. And it's great to be uh, back in Quito, even if it's Zoom space in Quito. Um, and to be part of this, uh, to be part of this series, it seems that drawing um, is of the moment. Um, we just had Perry Culper here uh, for a couple of weeks, giving talks and workshops and such. So I'll try to add just a, a couple of things. I'm going to start at first, though, by uh, uh, introducing the landscape critic Charles Waldheim, and specifically a fairly recent book, 2016, Landscape as Urbanism. Um, where he is uh, thinking the urban through landscape in his claim, thinking the urban through landscape and social, ecological, and economic dimensions. Uh, basically, what he's trying to do is sidestep, and he makes this claim uh, uh, pretty profoundly, uh, urban planning, urban design, and architecture, really trying to get uh, landscape architecture, if you will, to replace um, our discipline, I'll say architecture broadly, um, as the primary force behind envisioning uh, the future. So what's interesting to me about this series uh, is it allows us to meditate a bit uh, on drawing. And um, if I go back to Charles Waldheim for a minute, chapter nine is claiming landscape as architecture. Again, displacing us. If you're an architect, I'm an architect. Um, and then uh, chapter 10, landscape to ecology, which really uh, appropriately uh, recognizes um, a kind of self-critique of landscape, which has its own sort of etymological and historical baggage, uh, to be sure. Um, I'm much fonder of landscape architects than I am of Charles Waldheim. Um, I, they are my friends and collaborators. Uh, we work together, <laughs> you know, we envision things together. Um, and it's a world of cross-fertilization for me and not, not one of staking claims. Um, but I would say against that backdrop, we need uh, collectively uh, uh, to stake a claim for the potential of, of architecture. And in the context of this uh, uh, series, the, the, the potential for drawing. I'm going to make two contradictory points. A first, that historical and disciplinary, disciplinary techniques for us, again, as architects, meaning here plan section, perhaps axonometric diagram, they remain pertinent. Um, even though we can design and build through Revit, Rhino, and CNC milling, traditional disciplinary skills allow us to both read or understand our discipline's history and allow us to work projectively through the abstraction of the plan and the section um, to describe form, to construct a uh, spatial narrative. And for me, certainly it's not an either or, uh, but a both end, which is to say, we have more tools, um, but we haven't lost any. Hopefully, we haven't lost any. It may be, uh, as we move forward culturally, uh, more an issue of the problems that we address uh, than, the, than the tools that we use. So that might suggest a shift of the lens or transposition of our techniques uh, to new problems of design, be they climate change, territory, species extinction, extinction and social inequities. So I guess in that sense, in, in sort of um, 
persisting in traditional conventions, I show my age. Um, the second point I'm going to make, again, the contradictory point, is that new tools allow and are necessary to vision to draw the future, be it GIS, real flow, drone photography, LIDAR scanning, Rhino, Grasshopper, Photoshop, et cetera, and there, are, there is a new one every week. Um, in that sense, this side of the argument, or this argument, would argue that there is a new cosmology. The technology has, trans has transformed the world and that we, at least we as architects, are just now and desperately trying to, to catch up. Um, I'm susceptible, given the day or the hour, to both arguments. Um, but I would say that we as architects, also illustrators to be sure, Olympia, <laughs> but we as architects and designers are uniquely uh, positioned to uh, envision uh, the future, uh, though not alone, uh, to be sure. So I think there's a lot at, at stake. Um, and what I'll try to do today is uh, show uh, conventional drawings for conventional problems, uh, conventional drawings for unconventional problems, unconventional drawings for conventional problems, and unconventional drawings for unconventional problems. So let's begin. Um, I, I uh, have taught drawing. Um, Knowing Olympia was, would be here, I thought it would be good to show Giacometti and Mirandi. Um, I've taught drawing and really just uh, teach it as uh, having, we'll say, three prongs, descriptive, analytic, uh, and projective. And so we might talk about the, the stunning Giacometti drawing on the left, better known for his kind of linear metal sculptures, or the a Still Life by Giorgio Mirandi, who spent 50 years of his life drawing approximately the same thing. You might call these drawings descriptive. Um, but embedded in each obviously is a kind of personality and a set of interests. So when we draw descriptively, we're not just describing the world, but we rather, and Olympia, I think, gave a great introduction, and not an introduction, great performance in that relation. Um, uh, seeing it uh, 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 somewhat uniquely. So if Giacometti is in, deeply interested in volume and, and, and form and relationships, uh, Mirandi much more so in profile uh, uh, light uh, and, and definitely a, a, a light. One is almost transparent, the other kind of solid figures on the page. Um, uh, architects also uh, draw descriptively. So this is uh, Valerie Herrera uh, drawing a figure in motion. Um, is just trying to describe a figure in motion. Again, it is um, certainly somewhat, uh, 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 we'll say the artist's take. It's not trying to describe, if you will, a specific figure, but in this case, I would argue really trying to uh, make an inquiry into drawing types and not new to be sure, drawing types that might register uh, motion. Um, in a film uh, that I'm working on, uh, in a way, it's a registration of a whole series of drawings um, that ultimately become uh, 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 filmic. Um, and again, here interested in, in a way, a kind of still that could uh, indicate uh, uh, transformation over, over, over time. Moving to the analytic, just you know, quickly here, um, uh, I still believe, and many of us still believe, that good fundamental analytic skills are useful. Uh, so here are a couple of drawings from uh, some of our, a couple of our students um, in Italy, um, using the diagrams, plans, sections, but certainly here cutaway axonometrics to interrogate uh, works of architecture which is both to understand them formally and spatially, but also to develop a set of techniques that one ultimately could work uh, through uh, projectively. I'll move to my own work here uh, again, uh, just for a little bit. So this is the conventional and the conventional. I have worked and continue to work in plan sections, axonometrics and diagrams as a way to envision uh, 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 new works. So on the left, uh, a project from the last millennium, uh, a courthouse before we had reached the digital age, if you will. And on the right, a series of drawings, little tiny diagrams that are trying to bring conceptual clarity, interrogate and bring conceptual clarity to this industrial arts center uh, projected for the, the city of Cincinnati. Obviously, if you look at the bottom of the page, the bottom register, there is a kind of a different set of, uh, of envisioning tools uh, after those diagrams or simultaneous with those diagrams uh, that move uh, to the digital. 
And then another uh, even more recent, uh, again, just to insist on uh, conventional techniques, axonometrics, little section sketches, perhaps a perspective as ways to try to think through and start to project in this case, uh, a, a chapel uh, for a university. Also upper right now, uh, more refined digital diagrams and obviously a rhino and, uh, and render. Conventional drawings for unconventional work. Um, this is again, my uh, really chicken scratches uh, for this project, um, <laughs> along with my notes and telephone notes and whatever else is going on at the time. Um, for an exhibition uh, for that was asked a bunch of architects to uh, design an object, design and build an object that had to be white, um, I'm anti-object. I don't think we make objects. Um, I think we construct relations. And so in my effort to, to not make an object, um, instead made a kind of publication um, that used uh, the drawing. If we look at the upper left, maybe that's the easiest way to look at it. We'd start with a drawing and then a poet friend of mine um, would make a response to the drawing, which would spawn another drawing, which would spawn another passage, which would spawn another drawing. So the piece you see across the bottom is just one segment of a rather long kind of conversation between these kind of cartoon drawings and an author's response, um, trying to see this again, not as an object, but rather as something that was in, uh, that, that is in uh, motion. And I would say here, conventional uh, methods, photo montages for unconventional problems, be that gross max uh, on the right, a really foregrounding landscape matter in a photo montage or uh, uh, one of my own, you know, really trying to radically juxtapose uh, at Temple, uh, Templehof Airport, uh, two kind of eras um, uh, for a new proposal for uh, that, that airfield. Oh, a sort of a mix, my partner, Ann Munley, one of my partners, Ann Munley, um, a, a mix of, of, again, conventional drawings with um, uh, unconventional results, um, but also uh, new technologies available to us. Uh, she has been working on uh, milling in different ways, um, uh, material that is typically stiff and milling it so that it could bend, simple enough. Um, and you can see little diagrams in the lower left. Um, that red drawing in the, in the upper register in the middle um, is just a CAD drawing, two-dimensional drawing. But embedded within that, uh, ultimately, after so many tests, is the capacity for that when it comes to, oh, it be a PVC panel, or in this particular case comes to, to plywood, that it could take a stiff material and, and let, it, uh, let it bend many different products, some uh, Rhino models and subsequent renders, uh, some 3D printing, trying to test ways in which it might, uh, ways in which it might combine. But if it goes from sketch to, to we'll say CAD, to Rhino, to 3D printing, um, ultimately one iteration of it is the material uh, artifact. Um, uh, this is a recent um, uh, exhibition uh, that, that, that she had um, nearby here. Um, that is using, again, those techniques and technology, some of which are quite traditional, uh, meaning a two-dimensional drawing of a, of a surface, um, but towards an end that makes them rather uh, 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 robust and certainly pliable. Other drawings that seem at one level quite conventional, it's an urban plan uh, work that I've done with the landscape architect, but as, as we meditate on drawing, and I, as I look back at this, realize that it's obviously it requires topography, but it requires GIS, uh, enormous amount of information uh, embedded in GIS files that will allow us to understand vacant, vacant land, the tax delinquent land, areas of poverty, parks, schools, a whole number of things that could inform, in this case was trying to inform, a public as to where we might intervene uh, along this uh, body of water that runs through uh, the, the, the city of Syracuse. Um, again, what I'll call conventional, really, really conventional drawings. Um, 
I'm part of a team that was working on the Basilica of San Marco in, in Venice. Um, these are just sections of cores taken through uh, the earth, basically through the floor of San Marco. Um, our aspiration here, architect intersecting with archaeologists, was not trying to do a historical reconstruction of anything, but rather uh, our, our mission um, was to start to allow the archaeologists and others, scientists and, and historians, to understand um, in, in three dimensions where uh, material was underneath the basilica. Um, and so what you're seeing here is the underside, if you will, of the Basilica of San Marco. And those little red dots are pieces of oak that were part of the Zatarone, part of the foundation systems of, of, of the Basilica. Um, but it would allow us and ultimately them uh, to understand the disposition of those pieces of oak so they could better understand the foundation system and, and the, we'll say the disposition, uh, meaning non-alignment um, relative to the early, early settlements of, of Venice. A little workshop I ran a couple of weeks ago, uh, trying to get students to um, understand both the maybe three things. Um, one was to assign them a species that they're less than familiar with. So in this case, the morel mushroom. Um, each student gets a species to both situate it diagrammatically. And so if we look at the image on the left, it's almost 19th century in its roots, kind of taxonometric drawing of the morel mushroom. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I would argue too ripped out of its uh, 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 mycelial context, if you will. Um, but, you know, information diagram uh, uh, that is trying to be straightforward and pictorial. The one on the right asked the students to image uh, given that species, but image from the point of view of the species. Of course, they can't do that. We can't do that. But what What if we could? <laughs> what if we were a mushroom? What would the world look like? And so the image on the right uh, is intended to be um, the world um, as it appears, if you will, uh, 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 to a mushroom. And really trying to juxtapose the kind of uh, imaginary uh, on the right uh, the kind of impossible possible with the fundamentally diagrammatic and in informational on, on the left. I want to move to a couple of, of thesis projects fairly quickly here. Uh, this now moves to what I would argue are unconventional uh, 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 technologies and techniques uh, of drawing for un unconventional uh, uh, issues and, and, and problems and concerns. So in this case, it's the drone, it's the drone, it's aerial photography or aer aerial uh, photogrammetry uh, that, that is the tool. Um, and in this case, really following uh, along Laura Kurgan's lines and also uh, Ilio Weisman, um, using the, the drone photography as a way to do uh, forensic, what's been called forensic uh, architecture. Um, and so in this case, uh, a student that was looking at a very much in the skull still, um, uh, secretly looking at um, uh, lands, contested lands um, uh, between, the, between the, the Kurdistan regional government and the Iraqi federal government. So there's the tool on the right is we're just asking the student to use the tool for a local quarry. Ultimately, uh, in his case, using that tool to try to analyze with some degree of specificity uh, the destruction that has, has occurred in, the, in those territories um, and could only do so, if you will, in this case with, uh, with a, a drone photography. Another project, different set of tools um, and another project that I would argue could not be envisioned without um, a, a, a kind of expanded tool set. Uh, uh, here are students uh, interested in uh, terraforming um, and ultimately landing on, on uh, Hecla, uh, the, the, volcan the volcano Hecla in Iceland. Um, and uh, fortunate enough to find a, a volcanic lab not, not too far um, away, but the real tool here, I would argue, well, there's, there will be both. Clearly, there's a kind of mapping that's going on, very traditional 
uh, d described mapping. There's a kind of chronology, again, very traditional if we look at the right, chronology of eruptions over, over time. Um, so we have that on the one hand. And so on the far left, you, you, you see really then the, the uh, uh, palimpsestic history of the eruptions at Hecla over the last uh, couple of hundred years or so, or maybe less. Um, the critical technology in the middle are just screenshots from uh, a software called RealFlow that can project where um, uh, liquids of certain, certain viscosity will go over time. And so it was really, it, the, the terraforming project um, really um, could be projected, if you will, only through uh, the software real flow. Ultimately, uh, they're constructing something around the, uh, the volcano to try to trap where lava might go and in a way construct a, an architecture of the future based on projections of, of future eruptions. But we get back to conventional tools section on the left and then a physical model the results of one of the one of the volcanic uh, experiments on the on the right uh, another now really non-authored project is one that gets set up uh, here looking at fukushima to the antarctic um, seeing that from simply from google earth from gis but then using a neural style transfer as a way to take those landscapes, um, each uh, uh, fragment of those landscapes and transfer it time and time again to produce these kind of uh, so-called re-enchanted uh, representations. Uh, this by Emily uh, Pelisano. And so as opposed to looking at an aerial, they become through a certain kind of uh, uh, style transfer manipulation. So this is not someone controlling the so much the um, you know the mouse to draw but rather just putting input to see what might come out I mean merges these are just stills from a film that was basically from that film strip that you saw uh, in the previous image and another uh, another of the same so here again I would argue that you know the images are produced uh, obviously through uh, new, uh, new uh, technologies. I'm going to close with a very, very simple project um, uh, and, and relatively recent um, and loop back to uh, really simple drawings, be perhaps because it's a project of my own. Um, uh, Chicago ran a, the Burnham 2020 prize on the 100th anniversary of the, of the Chicago plan um, in the summer of 2020. And Burnham's plan was a, is a very well-known uh, uh, master plan for the city of Chicago. And so here I might be looping back a bit to, to Charles Waldheim and, and you know, his claim, uh, his claim for and his uh, for landscape architecture and his claim against the architects, urban planners, urban designers. Um, so the proposal or the project, the competition was to simply now take a step back and give us a chance again to re-envision uh, Chicago. So what we did uh, is make a really small uh, intervention or series of interventions. Again, very conventional drawings, some very quick and not so lovely sketches of mine that ultimately try to produce or think through uh, this mobile unit, a mobile unit that could be wheeled around uh, Chicago and that the drawing wouldn't be so much our drawing of, the, of this apparatus. And so here apparatus is opposed to plan, um, but that the drawing would be something that uh, the residents of the city uh, uh, ultimately would inscribe that this uh, th uh, three paneled uh, uh, Ruberg like uh, apparatus uh, would be unfolded and chalk handed out and the citizens of the city could envision cartoon uh, make marks, commentary, uh, discuss, and debate across that across that uh, chalkboard, and to think then that it could um, proliferate across the city, um, be set up and taken down, perhaps photographed on a nightly basis as a kind of record, a kind of archive, if you will, of the citizens' um, uh, wishes. But the citizens' wishes now, not through editorials, 
um, or through pictures, uh, but rather uh, rather through uh, their images and 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 drawings. And that's it. Thank you, Ted. Um, I think that was great to see. You know both spectrums today <laughs> of of different scale, definitely. So. Um, and thank you, Olympia, as well, uh, again, for, for those inspiring talks. I will give the floor to Christian, who will be conducting the Q&A. And um, yes, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Olympia, and thank you, Ted. I think that perhaps we could begin with uh, this question of collaboration. Because usually we tend to think that drawing is a sort of uh, an activity done just by one person. And Melissa asks um, to Olympia, which was your favorite collaboration with the brand and how did it influence your future work? And I think that the same goes to Ted. Uh, well, I, I try not to, um, you know, uh, not even think about which is the best collaboration, which is the my favorite work, because um, I don't want to create any sort of hierarchy, especially because, as I said in the in the presentation, <clears throat> I like to mix high and lows. So there's nothing that's really like um, that I don't like or I mean, of course, some projects can be a little bit more complicated than others. But generally speaking, they're all great uh, opportunities to discover new um, landscapes, new uh, materials, new ways of expressing myself and, and creating a relationship. So um, the one um, collaboration that comes to mind just because I have it in front of me is this um, um, bot water bottle, like, um, yeah, water bottle um, that's, uh, it's, a, it's a tin and it's created for this uh, brand based in Bologna in Italy and um, called 24 Bottles. And it's a water bottle, like one of those coffee tumbler that you see everywhere. Uh, but um, basically they created the company because they want, they hope that people would use less uh, water bottles, plastic water bottles, and, and use more one of these portables um, bottles instead. And um, for the Earth Day last year or two years ago, uh, we created these patterns that you can see here. And it's made of mermaids, um, hoping that the idea of saving mermaids by not using water bottles would, you know, hopefully increase the selling of these kind of bottles and and let, and, and make make people use less water bottles. So in a way, uh, I like this kind of collaborations because sometimes it's not just decorating a product, but it's also creating a story for a purpose for a trying to inspire some sort of like way of thinking about how we use you know our planet or sometimes i i have the opportunity of uh, of uh talking with with either um uh brand agency or clients directly and and propose not just an illustration but also maybe a solution for some some problems like for example uh, i was asked to decorate a bottle of um, a liquor here in italy sambuca and I asked if we could use a, um, not a plastic wrapper, but something that wasn't plastic. And, um, and the company hasn't thought about it, but then looked into it. And in like two hours, they find an alternative material. So sometimes creating a collaboration with brands is not just like making a nice drawing, seeing it on the packaging, whatever it is, and then move on to the next one. But also it gives me the ability to kind of like think uh, not just about my uh, my um, illustrations, my decoration on the piece, but also how we can make this product better, and how I can I can um, improve my own experience of designing through raising some questions to the brands. And it's it's very very often I say no to collaborations because I don't believe in the in the values that the brands have. And also I think that that is very important, not because it's important to say no in general, but it's important to have uh, protect your own view uh, 
And sometimes if brands or, you know, entrepreneurs or clients don't um, support the same views that you have, it's okay to, to step away. And so, uh, but sometimes it's also a great opportunity to learn a lot of things about, especially working with, um, you know, family owned brands. There are so many in Italy and you can learn so many, uh, so much about like all the artisanal project processes and, and all these artisanal processes in a way or another come back into to my work I see it every time so every time it's a new opportunity to learn a few things that maybe you you didn't know before I'll just um, reinforce Olympia's comment that um, I, I don't have a favorite collaborator and even if I did I could not say it because I don't want to lose any of my collaborators um, I, I think that uh, really um, you know, maybe somewhat differently uh, for me, opportunities emerge. I've collaborated with philosophers, um, with obviously with archaeologists, with other architects, landscape architects. What we do is collaborative. Um, as an architect, um, you know, you have a big team, and it's always strange to me in school where uh, there's a sense that there's an individual student um, who has, an individual has sort of control and authorship of the design. Um, because the second you're out of school, you're collaborating. Um, and you're collaborating with civil engineers, lawyers, hopefully not, but yes, uh, you know, landscape architects, illustrators to be sure. Um, and I think there's a certain joy to that. Um, so sometimes you form a collaboration around a certain problem, sometimes you get pulled in. Um, and I think it's just, uh, that's, that's again, part of what we, part of what we do. Thank you. Um, a common question, uh, again, for both of you, seems to be related to the uh, design process. How do you begin a drawing? Uh, you know, when does it end? Does it ever end? And also how that or those drawings kind of uh, own some sort of style, the sense of a style. So could you elaborate, please? I'll start. Um, so, um, for me, it's, uh, the, the process, it, it really depends on the kind of like output and the kind of work that I'm doing, but generally speaking, I begin with a sketchbook. I have one in front of myself right now. And, uh, so it's a lot of like pencil and, and, you know, paper drawings like this. Uh, and I try to elaborate as much as I can in that sense. And then usually speaking, I talk with the client, I propose these sketches, pencil sketches, or sometimes I do them on the iPad. So they're a little bit more colored, a little bit more finished. And then if they like one of the options, I then move on to Illustrator. I use uh, Adobe Illustrator most of the times, sometimes Photoshop. And I translate that uh, sketch into a final. Um, what you've seen in the presentation are all finals. And then usually that final piece, especially for editorial work, just go to print. So you'll see it like a week after or two days after in a newspaper or a magazine. Uh, the process is a bit longer, of course, with uh, projects that um, deal with different materials and you know other brands but generally speaking that's that's pretty much what I do uh, every day and um, style the concept of style I don't really like to call it style because it looks like something that you've looked for desperately just to have your own language well um, well, for me, it was a process. It wasn't looking for a style that would be recognizable or, uh, you know, popular in that moment. It's, it's a process. So basically, um, when I started, I was fresh out of school and I, I couldn't recognize myself in the drawings that I did. They weren't bad drawings, but when I saw them on paper, they couldn't reflect what I had in my mind. My inspiration, my references, my goals, they weren't on the page. So I felt like a, a um, sort of like a, a distance uh, from between myself and what I saw in front of me on the page. So I started working, trying to make that drawing or that illustration of those images as closer as possible to what I felt inside as well. And so trying to move in that direction, I think, and working with your instinct and instinct and trying really to understand what feels good or feels bad inside of you in, in terms of feelings and, and sentiment in a way 
help find a, a direction, or at least it worked for me. So uh, right now I have, my visual language is more recognizable than it was years ago. Um, and it's quite consistent, uh, consi consistent, but it changes every day, I even if people don't realize it because maybe it looks very similar one to another. But, you know, I remember I went to a trip to Mexico, for example, I came back home. And even if I didn't want to, I had new colors in my palette because I saw so many things around me. So even if like it's a new color every day or or like a little shape that changes a little bit every day, it's like a process. So there's never a moment where you're like, I found my style. Style is like a an elastic thing that that keeps moving and evolving. Ho hopefully, I, I, I hope that in 10 years I will you know express myself completely different than what I do now. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, sometimes I use a sketchbook. You know, I'm not as organized as Olympia. You know, I mean, I <laughs> there's a piece of paper in front of me, and I'm just, I'm just drawing. I think it's, um, and I think of it more. What are the in our in our discipline? What type of drawing allows you to explore the best? Explore the problem, or what types of drawings? So, is it a section? Is it a perspective? Is it image based? And I think that's useful. I think the hard problem uh, right now, at least for me, is to try to understand the scales at which. Uh, one might embrace a problem and how one you know, incorporates temporality in problems of design. And so how does how do you get that onto uh, the page in a sketch um, in sketch form? But I, you know, I'm I'm the same. I'm you know, it's manual <laughs> uh, uh, for the most part. Um, we have another question, which I think it deals with the sort of uh, capacity of the drawing to suggest something else beyond the information that it contains. This is a question by Boris, and he asks uh, to Olympia, how would you define irony and how is it present in your work? Why is irony important in art? Well, I, I have a feeling like I couldn't say I like only art that's ironic because it sounds like I, I envision immediately images that are like Warner Brothers or cartoons or things like that, which is really not what I like in my taste. But, um, but I think that irony, um, and this goes for any practice, I think, and any um, any anything that has to deal with interaction. Irony is the base of communication, I think. Sometimes when I travel around the world, um, the difference and the, 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 the difficulties in communicating with other people uh, are not based on words and not knowing the other people, other people's languages, but not knowing other people's irony. So sometimes there are awkward moments because you don't understand each other's irony and so therefore i think irony is such a an instrument of communication so if you get the joke if you get the reference if you get the you know that 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 um we call it sfumatura which is like a shade um uh you immediately connect with the piece or with the other person. So irony, I think, is a way of communicating. So it doesn't have to be present in every piece. It does, not every piece has to make you laugh or make you um, smile, because that would be, for me, it would be forced. But creating this sort of relationship between um, cultural aspect and, and is really important, I think, uh, in, in whatever, whatever we do. Um, here, it is a, a, a question of, of my own. Uh, Olympia, you presented, uh, you mentioned two very uh, important references, uh, Ettore Sotsas and Alessandro Mendini. And when you see their work, you know, it's, it's bright, it's sprightly, it's, it's fun. And when you read their, um, their, their text, particularly Mendini's, you know, is, is very almost nihilistic, you know, he says, you know, this brightness, these this beautiful and fun colors are all, you know, just telling us that, you know, the sign goes nowhere, all the sign is just a redesign, the sign leads to boredom, repetition, so on and so forth. So I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit about sort of your own sort of ideological 
uh, let's say, uh, 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 messages or undertext in your work? That's a very difficult question, but what I can tell you is that one one day I was with Mendini and Mendini told me, I uh, I have to tell you something, I always wanted to be an illustrator in my life, <laughs> so maybe, um, mm -hmm. but no, aside from that, um, uh, I think that, um, you know, I, I don't try to force messages or, you know, ideologies into my work, but of course they come out in a way, like even, even when you're, when you're feeling, uh, when you're feeling something and you're, you're working at it, it's really hard to avoid putting a little bit of whatever you're thinking, whatever you're feeling inside your work. Uh, definitely there are some aspects of my work that deal with with topics that come out pretty often so for example all this idea of inclusion trying to use color not just as a decorative aspect but also as an inclusive um, tool uh, I can pick like one if I'm if I'm drawing a, a person like a figure I can pick a color for their skin in one second but every this this difference in a second changes completely the the message that I'm sending or the representation that I'm doing and so also like kind of like we're trying to refine this this sense of responsibility towards what's your what you're doing and why you're choosing some some things instead of others why you're trying to why you're deciding to represent a doctor as a woman and not a man for example uh or trying when you think of a couple not necessarily go for a, an heterosexual couple but think about the fact that the reality is much more uh various than that and um and of course, my work will not change the world, but I, I, I like to think that um, there's a sense of responsibility towards what I put in the world. And so uh, it's not just, again, as I said before, it's not just necessarily pretty drawings. Sometimes they are pretty drawings, but it's not just that. And it's a research that's that's continuous and that um, includes also like um, a sort of ideology. I don't know if I would call it like that, but but certainly uh, my point of view uh, on the world and my 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 views on on politics and and you know social topics are definitely in 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 my work. I I wouldn't define my work as political because I don't think it is. But in a way, what is political and what is not? So. Um, um, I think, especially, I, I believe, Ted, in, in architecture, that's a question that you're, you, you probably ask yourself all the time in terms of ethics and, you know. Yeah, yeah I think absolutely. Um, and I think it's very hard um, to avoid politics. Um, and so I think it's better to, um, yeah, there's ethics, there's morality, there's you know, ideology, as has been mentioned. And, um, you know, that's another fascinating question. And to what degree is design sort of taught and presented neutrally? And to what degree is it um, embedded with, with ideologies? And we don't have time to really get through all of that today. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I was wondering in, in, in your case, Ted, you know, the way that you presented uh, your drawings, you know, the white background, the, the soft lines, the, I think you use Garamond fonts, you know, mm -hmm. you know, there is a sense of unity uh, that uh, it could be read uh, as some sort of political ideological statement. Um, well, that's interesting. You know, I mean, I think if, if there's a, yeah, there's some of those projects I would say are more political than others. And certainly the last one, um, is, was really trying to um, um, implicitly uh, challenge Charles Weidheim, but, but explicitly uh, challenge the idea of what might constitute an urban plan today. So can you build a $20 bicycle um, and call and mobilize it and mobilize the citizenry as an idea of an urban plan? So for me, that's, that's political. And it was the same soft pencil <laughs> on white paper, uh, to be sure. Um, I think that uh, in that instance, um, you know, for me, it's sort of habit. Um, and I think that one could argue that there are different, uh, uh, probably, and I'm not going to do it again right now, but different politics behind different projects, if it's, uh, if it's the same soft pencil. Um, and I, I must say, maybe it's just my impatience, but the drawings don't seem to be getting any better over time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to Olympia, um, what is the influence or the importance of design and the culture of design in Italian architecture 
and vice versa. Well, no, that's a heavy question because mm. I'm I'm not a designer or nor an architect, so um, I, I just see it as a citizen and and uh, a person that loves both. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't know how to to reply to the question professionally, uh, but definitely I can say that they from to to see it from the outside they definitely go um, hand in hand, meaning that design. Uh, in a way informs architecture and architecture um, informs design. Um, and again, as I said, we're very privileged here because we're, we're all, even people who couldn't care less about architecture and design, we're all immersed in, in architecture and design. Um, even if you go to, you know, a town that's, you know, lost in the middle of the countryside, there's gonna be a little church or a little painting, or uh, you know, a, a, an infrastructure that's that's built by 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 what you could could consider an author of design or architecture, uh, and it's not it's not to brag about the country. It's just like the, the way that the country it's shaped. So I think that these two elements are so present in in our background. And, uh, and therefore, it's very interesting, for example, for me, it's so interesting, uh, American architecture is so interesting as North American architecture, uh, you know, like, like um, Las Vegas or Los Angeles for me are, are so interesting places to look at because they're the opposite of what I've been um, exposed to. And um, and so I I, I feel I'm, I'm very fascinated by uh, an a kind of architecture that we as Italians would call fake, but uh, but that now has a history. Like I'm thinking about all the uh, you know um, you know a fairy tale houses in in Los Angeles or uh, that kind of architecture. We think about it as a fake kind of architecture, but now, but it was made in the twenties. So now it has a history. It's it's a, it's a historical piece of, of architecture. So um, I think that um, you, when you develop a curiosity and an eye for architecture, you can find wonderful, uh, and, and design as well. You can find wonderful uh, inspiration around the world, everywhere you are. I would just say um, that um, Italy is a country of design, and not only is there the small uh, church in the small village or the large church in the small village, um, think of something like Loreto, uh, but there's also a bunch of kindergartners there on a school trip, and right behind them are first graders. So design is embedded and culture and history is embedded um, at a really, really early age in Italy. And I give um, Italians great credit, but I, I, I give their, well, their sense of design quite broadly now and their sense of history, great credit to a kind of educational system and mission that's just part of the culture. And we don't have it in the US and I don't know about Ecuador. We're still uh, studying those sort of aspects here. Um, one question I think that, uh, uh, again, for Olympia and Ted is, um, do you think the pandemic uh, somehow caused a change on, on your work? Uh, if so, how? Uh, go ahead, Ted. Um, I would say more on my life than on my work. And of course, you would say those two are in intimately related. I just loved Olympia's illustration, you know, of her her life in her apartment. Um, uh, you know, um, I've been col collaborating digitally for a very long time. We have to if you've got a project in South Korea and your engineers in India, you've got to figure out a way to communicate. I think that if anything, uh, the pandemic helped our uh, capacity to communicate. Uh, not being in the same room, like we're all now on Zoom. Um, so in that sense, I think it helped. Um, I say in terms of my work, you know, um, nothing's going to help my work. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I work when I, as I work and when I work, you know, and I hope to have time to work. Um, so for me, the biggest issue is time. And I would say that the pandemic just uh, screwed us all in terms of time. Um, and so that that's a, that was a problem. The biggest problem for me was just the time suck of of uh, having to deal with all the adjustments we had to make. Um, uh, 
more than certain kinds of productivity. Yeah, for me, uh, similar, and but it also was a, I have to be honest, it was a, a aside from everything else, obviously, um, it was a, a moment to kind of like go back to a little bit to the, um, I wouldn't say the roots because I'm, I'm, I'm quite young, but to, to go back to research, which is something that unfortunately I don't have much time to do uh, usually. And so even to stop for like an hour or have an idle hour where you can, you know, read something and go back to a sketchbook that you did like two years ago and see if there's any idea, any, anything left in it. Or, um, you know, uh, I was so, um, I was, I felt like the need of going to an exhibition, but I couldn't. And therefore I tried to make myself an exhibition and, 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 and go around and take a look at my books, you know, those wonderful photo books or coffee table books that you buy and never look at. Uh, it was a wonderful time to actually go through them and, uh, and kind of like recreate a more, as I said before, like a sort of like uh, an analogic way of going through things, uh, which I think sometimes is uh, taken for granted, but it really is another, another experience compared to just like spending hours online clicking on one image after the other. So um, for, for research, it was something, it's, it was a moment that for me was absolutely necessary. And, um, and a lot of things came out of it. So uh, it wasn't fully, completely bad. Uh, and, and again, of, of course, I'm talking exclusively about my experience as a, as a professional. And one final question, just uh, because of the time, it's uh, that I got in a private message. Uh, it's related to drawing and sort of personal relationships. In the case of Ted, they're asking me about if you could elaborate on this notion of drawing, passing information to your students, your relationship of you as a professor and your students through drawing. And to Olympia is a question, I don't know why, what's the reason behind this question, but uh, they are asking me to ask you about your relationship with your father. Cool. <laughs> you want me to go, okay, want me to go first? You... I'll go first, that <laughs> yes, way you please. can think about that. <laughs> um, well, certainly I talk about drawing all the time uh, with my students and clearly I, at the thesis level, have encouraged them to adopt new techniques and tools for new sets of problems. Um, that said, um, I still teach undergraduate students, and I feel that there's a, we'll say, a poverty of conventional drawing. Uh, students get so excited about two things, one about Rhino, you know, a program, three-dimensional program that you can just jump in um, and start making things, or image. Um, and it's really great to see Olympia's really kind of carefully studied work with precedents that are sometimes broad, sometimes uh, narrower. Um, you know, my, my opinion or my, what I offer to them is, is that making images is easy. Trying to make a plan is remarkably difficult. And, and, you know, cutting a rhino model does not equal a plan or a section or anything else. So I spend, and what I do um, is I, I draw through projects with them I still. Um, and and um, I'll say more than encourage them to take on the, some of the conventional uh, methods of drawing. At the same time, they're exploring as they should uh, new, new techniques and technologies. Uh, as as for me, I think the question was referring mostly about the project that I mentioned during the presentation that was born out of an idea of me and my father. Uh, my father is a photographer and uh, specifically in the design field. So um, he works with some, some brands. And of course, the profession has changed a lot since digital photography and uh, iPhones and stuff. So it was interesting uh, and scary to see it to see it changing uh, but aside from that he's always been surrounded by uh, design and objects and you know product design interior design in he works in that field and again like I've always worked in the illustration field since I started but um, but again I have a, a fascination towards that that uh, world so um, he he and I decided to um, do something together 
uh, especially because, uh, of course, I, I moved out of my, my dad's apartment like many years ago. So it's also a way to keep us together and, uh, and create something that would, um, you know, give us the opportunity to just have a lunch. Some, I have a business lunch uh, here and there. And, um, and so we decided to find something that would, we both are enthusiastic about, which are, you know, objects and things. And so we started collaborating with a lot of uh, Italian artisans, so which were not, all, not just Italian, but most of them are Italians. And so it was a great opportunity also to know a lot about, you know, other realities and the other, uh, you know, techniques and stuff and uh, going on a trip with him to, you know, go to the ceramicist in Verona or going to, you know, other, other, um, other places to meet other people was also a great uh, opportunity. Uh, it's like we built this project um, uh, unknowingly to find an excuse to be together, basically. Um, and that's also, I think, a good um, a good excuse. If you have a friend uh, that you don't see a lot, if you have like a lover that's on the other side of the ocean, uh, creating a little project with them could be um, could be also a great excuse to spend some time together. And that's pretty much what uh, this relationship uh, with Claude Miro, this brand, is about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olympia. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. That was a fun conversation. And that, that end note, I have to confess, it was mine. <laughs> that <is the> <laughs> because... Um, I I had confessed to Olympia that I follow her for quite a while, and I was always very intrigued by this like sort of, you know, relationship that you mentioned. Even you know, like little details of like your dad having this long rope that you mentioned yesterday, <laughs> and I was like, mm. um, it made me laugh because I also have a very close relationship in the professional sense with my father too. But I wanted to thank you both so much. It was a pleasure uh, talking through emails. And I hope a life brings you to Ecuador and the Galapagos. Hopefully. That will be yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. Hope to do that it relatively soon. Uh -huh. It will be really, uh, it will be amazing if we can like uh, make like this kind of seminars like with with you here in Quito and you can really know uh, the environment and why we really were interested in you as, as panelists today. So thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having yeah. us. It was great. Thanks for hosting. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank day. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Gracias a todos por estar aquí hoy día.